We're here, episode number four, with James Carpenter, the Doncaster Rovers captain. And I've been very excited to have this conversation with you. And I've had a lot of interesting questions coming about all sorts of different areas. And it's been quite a crazy reaction. You're quite a popular guy when it comes to Doncaster Rovers fans, anyway. Uh, yeah. It's great to have you. How have you been doing today? Um, yeah, really good. It's it's my first day off um, after going back to training. So I've been um, training since Monday, six solid days. Um, so I've had a well well earned rest um, and spent a bit of time with the family. So it's yeah, it's good to have that day and then look forward to to a good week next week. Was it hard to kind of keep in a condition once the season sort of came to a halt in the middle of the whole pandemic that was going on? Yeah. Yeah, I think I think it is. Oh, it was difficult because we never knew it was the uncertainty. So we never knew when we were coming back, if we were coming back. Um, so we'd obviously be given programs um, to to sort of adhere to, and we wouldn't be. We would have to go and find our own sort of pitch to run on. Um, and doing that by yourself, I've never really had a problem sort of getting motivated um, as an individual. But a lot of the younger lads, I think found it harder um, and again it's just the uncertainty of when we were coming back and our season finished uh, we finished ninth just outside the playoffs um, so we obviously finished the season whereas the lads that were in the playoffs um, went on and played uh, till the end yeah. of the season so um, yeah it was it was it was difficult but at the same time probably looking at it the last six days have been good for me and, and shows how much work I have put in yeah I mean, you, you've been a big advocate for mental health in general, and I was quite curious to find out well, what what was the effect to you in terms of you're obviously a very active person. You like to get about and keep yourself busy, and all of a sudden, I've you know everything. The world kind of stops. Everything's on pause. And you're having to sort of rejiggle your whole sort of schedule in life. Did that have any sort of effect on your mental health during that time? Um. Not really. I mean, my wife's a nurse. She's a paediatric nurse, so she was she was in the front line. She was um, going to work, and I've got three kids as well. So my responsibilities changed um, initially when it when it all first happened, and it's sort of a mind shift to more important things, really. Um, so you don't well. I didn't really have a chance to think about anything. It was more about just getting on with it. Um, and making the best of, of the situation, which I have done for the last five months. I think something that I have learned over the years is to adapt to what's happening around you. If you can't control it, then don't let it affect you. Um, and I've been really good at that. And it's something that I try and sort of help other people with in terms of sort of uh, my kids, uh, my wife, sort of trying to trying to help them. So a lot of my time is is doing that. Yeah, and you make a great point there about how you should really just focus on what you can control. And I think one of the things after researching is you've been really good at being able to sort of focus on your own goals and, and focus on what you can deal with. And a lot of people struggle with that and focusing on exactly what it is that they're capable of. I mean, you've been playing football for a long time and this is you've, you've kept the decision that this is going to be a final season. What was that? What was that like? How did that come out for you? What was that kind of discussion like? I think over the last sort of um, four or five months since I've had time off to think about what's next for me. When you get to thirty nine, forty, um, I've been I've been sort of waiting to retire for the last five seasons. Um, but every sort of season from thirty five, I've had a, a really good season. Um, played probably average 40 games and team of the season, player of the season, um, promoted at 37. So it's been difficult for me to hang my boots up when I'm doing so well. Yeah. And I don't mean that, I don't mean that in a sort of, <laughs> I'm not sh sort of um, showing off or anything like that. It, it's just the way it's been. I, I do enjoy what I do. Uh, in fact, I love what I do and that's why I'm doing it at 39, 40, but I can't go on forever. And I want to more or less finish on my terms I always wanted to get to 40 sort of in my, in my my early 30s I sort of set a target of trying to get to 40 um 
I believe I will get there and I get there playing well and doing well and contributing because I'd hate to think that my career just fizzled out and I was one of the one of the players that just hung on for as long as he could. Yeah, that's a really interesting point and it makes me wonder, over the last few years, generally speaking, physically, it would get harder as you go on. So what, do you, what would you put down the, your form over the last few years? What would you put that down to? Um, obviously, I'm massively on, uh, massively into the mental side of, of football and that that I would I would I would have to say that for me personally it's it's my the way I look at things. Um, I think for me personally playing the way I am, there's obviously other attributes. My diet, I don't have a special magic formula um, or anything that I do weird and wonderful. Um, I sort of I, I I eat and drink everything in moderation. Um, if you ask the sports scientist, there's nothing that I do that's that's again sort of extra in the gym. Mm. In fact, it's probably the opposite. As you turn 35, it's more about recovery, um, stretching, uh, soft tissue work, things like that, that that sort of allow me to go out and perform consistently well um, and play so many games. But I, I believe my my body's conditioned. The last 18 years, I've played over 40 games every, every season. Um, so there's no secret, but I think the one thing is the mentality. I wake up every morning looking forward to training. Um, every day I train, I train like I play. Um, and it's just about sort of building on it and not not settling for for the same thing. It's 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 although I'm 38, 39, played so many games, achieved achieved so so much in football. I don't ever think about that every single day. It's all about that day, that specific moment. Yeah, yeah. Well, taking it back to kind of the start of your career, when you, when you signed for Newcastle from a really early age, what would you say the, the difference in your mindset from then to now? Uh, it's a very good question. I think right now there's no there's no comparison, but I I was the, the I wasn't aware that that there was anything like this. And and when I say anything like this, all I'm talking about is an understanding of how to think in the right way um, and how how it plays such a big part in your results and your actions. So when I when I was at Newcastle for four years, I never believed I should have been there. Um, so I, I was constantly telling myself I wasn't good enough. Um, why why am I here? Why did I, why did Kenny Dalglish sign me? Why is Sir Bobby Robson giving my debut? Um, I never actually believed I should have been at that football club. Um, but then I wasn't aware that I could change or that was having an effect on anything that I was doing. Um, so when I then went into Exeter and then got relegated out of the Football League at 2021, um, it was exactly the same. I was constantly sort of, my self-talk was terrible. I was letting others affect me and control me. Um, I wasn't taking responsibility for anything that I was doing. I was constantly blaming other people or been swayed or by being controlled or conditioned by everybody else. Yeah, I mean that it's so common and it's so it's one of those things that once you realise it and you look back on it, you go, how did I not realise this earlier? On? <laughs> um, yeah. But it's 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 a it's a struggle for everyone. Everyone goes through these problems and you have managed to recognise that and overcome it. But when you talk about your your situation at Exeter when you relegated and you were considering quitting football. Um, you mentioned that uh, part of the change that was meeting a motivational speaker. Is that right? Um, yeah, he, he, Terry was more of a mentor. Um, at the time, he was he was sort of just starting out. But for me, he yeah, you're right. He he more or less showed me or give me the tools to to start working on this. I, I believe I'm still. Well, I know that I'm still working on this. It's it's a lifelong process, um, personal development, uh, mindset training, whatever you want to call it, um, self-development. There's so many different ways to, to sort of describe it. And there's so many things out there, but uh, he gave me that sort of, that starting point that, you know what, you can start doing this and it will affect your results. And I was like, right. So all I have to do is think differently to get a different result. And then, from that moment on, the next day I started doing it. The next day I started doing it. The next day, so every day from that moment on, I developed 
what I call a professional mindset. Um, I developed something that allowed me to get result after result after result after result. It's not a coincidence that my career at 21 uh, went from strength to strength. I got uh, a new contract and then we got promoted. I mean, sorry, then we won the Johnson's Pate final. Then we got promoted. Then we spent three seasons in the championship. I got another new contract. Um, I was doing things off the field. It, it, it all coincided with with me con- uh, gaining control of my life, really. Yeah, and you know that whole way you described that is exactly the same for me. It's exactly the same for me. Um, in the same sort of scenario, and we we come we come from different sort of backgrounds and different stories, but also similar uh, principles to it. And listening to you talk about it, it makes me think about the fact that you play you know, mainstream professional football and I play wheelchair football, and yet those two things are seen as kind of distinctly different things. Um, and I listen to you talk and I think, you know, we are actually quite alike. And a, a lot of people don't wouldn't apply the same principles to disability sport and to these things. And I think one of the reasons for that is because of the, the way it's disability sport is seen and the perception of it and how we don't take ourselves very seriously as athletes. Uh, even for me, when I, when I was going through my struggles and things like that, uh, like you say, it was only when I started changing the mindset and that I was able to actually accomplish it. And as I go on, but what what t- what tends to happen is you got, especially in my sport of professional football, where you get a lot of different a lot of different people with a lot of different issues, and there's deep rooted things that we don't ever really get to discuss because it's it's seen as just the way it is because we're born we're born that way and we just need to sort of accept it. Uh, and I think that. Looking at the way that you approached it, what do you think could be done in the, or should be done from a disability sport point of view that could be implemented to make it to help change the sort of perception of it from being from being that from being this long as a professional footballer? Looking at I know you get I know you know guys like Owen Swift at Teesside PFC, who's a team that I've just joined in English Premiership. Um I had to mention him because he yeah, I to, <laughs> but I mean yeah. But uh, I've, I'm one of the first Scottish players alongside Logan Richardson to join an English team, and we were we came to, we came down, and we're sort of seen as the outsiders because there's a there's a there's a you know there's a significant gap between the standards of the Scottish league and the standards of the, of the English league, even the power shift football. Um, now, looking at but looking at being a professional football and looking at the way it sort of became this global phenomenon. And then you look at how women's football has came on and getting more coverage alongside different sports. What is, why is disability not in that discussion as much? What, is, what do you believe could be done from, a, from that point of view to make it more on an equal playing field? I think, like you said, I think it's about um changing the mindset changing the perception by doing what you're doing i think it's amazing um when we spoke prior to this and i've looked at what you've been doing and um what you've been achieving it's it's unbelievable and i think small steps is is always um frowned upon but i think that's that's the way everything goes i think you've got to make small inroads into into changing that perception um and creating that mindset, it doesn't it doesn't matter if it's it's professional football or wheelchair football. It's exactly the same. It's it's like you said, bring your bring your A game, bring everything that you've got, um, and have that professional mindset. Have that understanding that it doesn't matter whether you've got a disability, you can still perform, or you still have to perform to the best you can perform. And that if that means you have to prepare in the right, right right way and do all the things that give you that opportunity like you have, then I think people be, will be more aware of it, um, getting it out there. Uh, I think I think there should be more uh, done in that way. There should be more sort of, um, it should be more highly publicised. I don't know, obviously you, you're in it. What, what, yeah. what do you think? Well, as you make, as, it's all true what you're saying there and I appreciate the nice words, but one of the things that I would tell you is, I mean, the English, the English national team just won the European Championships last year. And I'm not sure if it was last year or the year before, but it was definitely recently. And they're the first team to win, 
a major tournament uh, since the World Cup winners back in whatever year it was because you're English. I don't keep, I keep up to. I don't keep, I'm Scottish, man. I don't care about doing English. English yeah. Um, I try and I try and pretend it didn't happen, you know. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, uh, they were the first team to do it, and you know when you do something like that, you. And the way they did it, actually, I'll, I'll tell you because it's a really, it was an incredible game to watch. And even though I'm Scottish, I had to, I was watching it and I found myself cheering them on because it was an incredible thing to, to see. They were 2 0 down to France in the final of the of the European Championships. And earlier on in the tournament, had lost 3 0 to them pretty comprehensively. Um, and then later on, so they're 2 0 down. There's about 10, 15 minutes to go, and they pulled it back to 2 2. But to put that into perspective for you, that doesn't happen, that doesn't happen in poetry football. It's, right. so, it's, it's so unlikely, it's so unheard of to see that. And um, they, you know, there was a point where the French team had pulled away from everybody so much. The, the gap was so big, and there's two different. I mean, guys like Chris Gordon and John Bolden, they're the two of the mainstays in the English team, would tell you that, you know, there's two different styles to it, where, where the, French, the French team tend to dribble more, um, and the English team tried, the English team implemented sort of a new style of passing the ball, getting it moving and making it, you know, making it more like if you were watching a five-a-side game or a basketball yeah. game kind of thing. And that ended up allowing it to pull it back and they ended up winning the, the tournament on penalties. But it was so such an incredible story and how they managed to pull it off. And watching it as somebody that understands the sport and knew how, you know, what an incredible comeback it was. And to see the kind of lack of coverage for the mainstream media was it was one of those moments where I'm sitting there as a player and I'm I'm, I'm enjoying I love the sport and I want to achieve a lot of things in it and I want the sport to be bigger. And I'm seeing these guys pulling off something that's not something that happens all the time. And uh, especially in England, because England, Eng- you know, England do love the football and they love promoting it and they love talking about how the English Premiership is such a high quality league and it seems to be where every player wants to be now. It's, it's a go-to place. And when you look at the the PowerShare team getting to the pinnacle and then not really getting much of a shout out from anything, and that was a really moment where I started to go. As an individual, like you say, when you talk about personal development and focusing on ourselves, it's also promoting ourselves and saying, hey, we, we're here to compete. We're athletes. We're not just here to take part in some sort of inclusion-based thing, which is also, don't get me wrong, there's a, there's a side of that that's very important to have, considering everything that we go through and all the experiences we have. But there's also, there's also guys that I know dedicate their life to it and they dedicate hours and hours up to it and they deserve to be more recognised even in not just in powers of football but overall overall disability sports um, for example uh, Mike, there's Mike Yo who is known he is literally won the most gold medals of any Paralympian um, and uh, he you know not many people know who he is you know, you think people would know this guy's won five gold medals at the Paralympics, yeah. uh, and you barely even hear him. I didn't when I when somebody told me that, I thought I didn't even know who he was. So I look at, I look at that and I go, "That's <laughs> concerning to me." Um, and and what I'm trying to do here is essentially create a platform that gives us a bit of voice and uh, allows us to say we are actually equal. And I think it says a lot having you on as somebody who is a current professional footballer in the mainstream media and has that voice and you're coming on to talk to me and it maybe I'll lose people to see that yeah I'm under Russia and yeah you can walk but we're actually very we're more similar than people would expect you know and, and take our sport as serious as each other and that's where personal development kind of comes into it and sort of encouraging ourselves to get rid of the stigma behind disability and the, the overall perception of it and from there, I was wondering, now that you've decided to hang your boots, I've been looking at the work you're doing with, uh, you've got a, you, you're the owner of the, 
I'm forgetting the name now, which isn't good. <laughs> but yeah, pro mindset. Yes, pro mindset, and you're working with kids to help them develop from a very early age of like nine or ten years old, which is really cool to see. And I was wondering, how did you come across? What made you? What made you decide to get so heavily involved with helping out children and helping out the development? In that process. So you, you mean the Kicks Academy? Yes, yes, sorry. Yeah. yeah, so, no, so the Kicks Academy, um, it's something that my kids went to when I was in Doncaster. Um, so when they were sort of two and three, um, I, was, I was a player at Doncaster and obviously living in Doncaster. So we went there and then over the years, Kicks has developed into a franchise. So now there's over 45 franchises across the UK um, and my, my kids went to the very first one um, so I know the guy who owns Kicks um, and I absolutely loved his his mission statement which is to impact every child at every opportunity um, and just him in general sort of lives and breathes it he, he wants to make a difference to every child and, and that's exactly what what I'm about that's exactly what Sort of, I saw when I took my kids, um, and there's a fine line between. So our our, our academy is from ages two to six, um, and at that age, it's all about sort of having fun and going out and enjoying yourself, and it's, it's nothing's taken seriously. Um, they're learning and growing at the same time. Um, sort of being in and around different kids, and um, it's just a fantastic environment for kids to to develop skills um and get involved with football so yeah. I, I think that's where that came from and i obviously had an opportunity to to invest as a franchise owner um to to run my own business and have it as mine um in the northeast which, which is where i live now in middlesbrough so um it's, a, it's just a fantastic sort of um initiative i think yeah i mean it, it was great to be done it and like you said that business statement when i read it it really struck me as well and thought, wow, that's, he's, they're really doing something special there. And I really wanted to make sure that we kind of discuss that in depth because I was just saying that one thing it kind of sprung to my mind was I actually recently seen an interview with Joe Hart where he was talking about, he was, he was, he was training kids and when he was talking about when he was a kid, all he thought about was wanting to, you know, be a superstar, be in football and be, you know, be the England number one, go to World Cups and things like that. And then he was helping out these kids, and we weren't asking, we weren't asking them what it was, you know, what it was like to save a penalty for Messi, or what it was like to play at the World Cup. They were asking them, how do you deal with the noise from the crowds? How do you yeah. deal with the abuse that you get? And um, and that really struck him as something that was a concern because you've got kids from kids from really young ages now uh, struggling with mental health and struggling with how to deal with just life and playing football and being accepted in society. Um, and that's became more of an issue throughout the generations. Why do you think that the kids have become more susceptible to um, certain mental health issues, maybe more so than they have done in the past? I think, I, I personally think it's a lot down to, to mainstream sort of um, social media. Um, there's certain a certain lifestyle that people tend to lead. Um, and, and if you think about it now, where, where we used to watch, well, when I used to watch the telly, it was few and far between. We would be out all the time uh, interacting with people. Um, whereas now my kids are, are guilty of this is they sort of, they learn the majority of their things from watching YouTube by going, um, watching things on their phone, um, social media, Instagram, and there's so much out there for the expectation for kids is, is huge to, to, to act and behave in a certain way. Um, this is just, just my, yeah. my beliefs. Um, it's like football. When I was a kid, I grew up wanting to play football because I wanted to win things. I wanted to be successful. Um, I've always been competitive, whereas uh, for a lot of players now, it's about the money. It's about the fame. Um, it's about all the things that in my opinion, they don't last. It's, it's not, they can't sort of, there's no longevity there. Um, like I said in an interview recently that when, when a lot of players get to 30, 31 and 
the contracts are less and less. It's, it's so hard for them to stay in football because they actually, they're not playing football for the love of the game. They're playing it. A lot of them play, play, play it as a job um, or see it as a job. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, it's a difficult one. And I imagine a lot of people have a lot of opinions, but having three kids myself, I can see how things can develop in, in the way in which they start to become um, self-conscious, self-aware, um, questioning why they're looking or doing certain things. They might be getting criticised at, at school. Um, but at the same time, it was it was like that when we were kids. But um, that's why I feel like it's so important to be put in the right environment with kicks. It's about, for me, as a, as a kicks franchise owner, recruiting the right coaches that are sending the right messages out. Um, and it's the same for me as a father, sort of making sure that I understand how to sort of um, prepare my kids for these sort of things. Yeah, I think by doing that, you're really giving these kids a strong foundation and sort of build, build themselves and build characters that can deal with the ups and downs of life in a better way. And that kind of environment really does help you. Because, I, I mean, I recently talked about a bad experience I had with a football team where, the, where I was having that kind of feeling and that impact that it was positive that you were talking about, but it turned out to be to to be well, it end in sort of a bad way where I felt really discriminated against and really put down by it, and it ended up having a much a major negative effect. But if I look at that and I look, uh, flip it around, if you do what you're doing with having these kids in this structure and supporting them and giving them the right tools to understand how to deal with these things from a very early age and just enjoying football, not thinking of it as the mega global sport with the money and all that that it actually is, but thinking about it from what the joy you can get from scoring the goal and saving a penalty and things like that, making a good tackle and going back to the roots of the, what football is, which is a working class sport. It was a working class sport that's became this, like I say, global phenomenon. And um, you wonder... As to what you know, when they see the work you're doing and, and how you're approaching it all, the difference that will make will be so huge to them, and how they see themselves going forward. And that's I, I can't take my hat off more to you for that. Uh, one of the things that makes me think about is, for me, when I, when you when we talk about how the children are struggling more with mental health issues, one of the things that strikes me is like you say, mainstream social media and having to hold this sort of um, a certain lifestyle that appeals to that and how when I was younger and probably you were younger, all, all I was doing was going out and play football from morning to night, pretty much every day, you know, and just enjoying yeah. it, socialising and having fun. And I think now with te the growing technology, you've got um, a lot of different things keeping people on the side which ultimately takes you away from that social environment, which then makes you a bit more unaware of how to kind of handle yourself in society, which, you know, which I think leads to this kind of growing anxiety and depression because people don't know how to handle themselves, so to speak, because they're not, they've not been put in those situations. Um, for example, even for me, you know, I became very inward and very insecure unable to put myself out there and one of the things that I was experiencing was an inability to speak publicly it was something that was really a big deal to me and it was, it was a struggle and the only thing that really changed that was realising that you can really do anything as cheesy as it sounds to, you know it's, it's not as it's, it doesn't mean it's not true and that's something that's really dawned on me recently because even this podcast and talking to a guy like yourself was something I'd put off for quite some time. Um, I knew I was going to do it, I knew I wanted to do it, but I was on the cusp of being one of those things that I just had on the table, had everything organised, and I just, I was sort of scared to press the go ahead button, you know what I mean? And you can see that by the, even the breath that you took before you said that. Yeah, yeah. You can see, like, it's... Um... You, all that sort of yeah. has just come out there, which uh -huh. which is a which is unbelievable. It, 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 what you're doing and how you're doing it is it's exactly like I was when I go back to 21, 22, and it's it's like what you just said there. You can do anything that you want to do. I I I, I think if it's humanly possible, you, you can do it. Um, and 
we're conditioned to believe different by a lot of outside influences um, as we grow up. And that's why just I cut across you there. Sorry, but it was just, I think there's even more responsibility on parents now um, with what's sort of out there and what, what's accessible for kids growing up to, to understand how they communicate and understand what their kid need. It might be picking up on something or the way they are. Um, I know people and, and, and everybody's different and parents are out living their lives and working and, and I do get that. But at the same time, it is a huge responsibility bringing up kids and I think as a, as a coach or as a manager or as somebody, as a mentor, I do get a lot of benefit from, from passing on that experience and that knowledge. Yeah. Right. So well, we, we, we had some technical difficulties, there, but we're back. And um, we were just talking about how you've, you've started this whole thing, helping children with the, the kickstart program program and you but just before that you'd mentioned creating a mindset page um on instagram that you, you talked to me about and i went and checked out and seen how you're working on you give people advice on how to approach their own mindset and things like that and i was watching some of the work that you do and it was quite inspiring i was really motivated by it um what is the what's the username for that again the yeah it's um pro mindset is the company name um but it's based around, based around that, based around um, developing a professional mindset. So over the 15, 16 years that I've been working, um, developing or doing my own personal development stuff, I feel like people struggle with this sort of thing or, or struggle or there's a little bit of stigma attached to it because you can't see it. It's not tangible um, with the technical, tactical, physical, it's, it's all there. You can see it um, and you can see it working and improving. Um, with the mental side, it's, it's a little bit different. So for me, by creating a, a name like Professional Mindset um, and adding all these things like I talk about uh, professionalism, discipline, self-belief, focus, um, all these things are, are things and they're, they're things that you can work on, develop and get better at. And then they, they allow you to have a professional mindset and um, allow you to maximize your full potential. So if you have a professional mindset, in my opinion, you get the best out of your technical ability, your tactical ability and your physical ability um, because you're thinking in the right way. Uh, you can deal with setbacks, you can deal with disappointments. Um, so it was important for me to put something together that people can almost um see and draw upon when they're feeling these sort of things yeah it's almost like having a foundation in place for when you go through those struggles yeah to where you go yeah i'm struggling right now mainly but i can fall back on knowing that xyz with the discipline in my mindset and having these things in place where i know what are going to fundamentally make me feel better uh, when i do them um which is something that a difficult thing really because like you say it's not a tangible thing and one of the prob one of the difficulties with that really is that you don't is that a lot of the things that actually benefit you and make you feel better are really difficult. Um like you've seen that video I posted yesterday where I'm in the, I'm in the gym and I'm doing cardio and twenty minutes into it I'm totally burst. But I said to myself I was going to do half an hour. Um, and one of the things that happens to you when you set yourself if you set yourself a goal and you achieve that, well, regardless of how big or small it is, you start building up confidence in your own mindset and belief that when you set something out, you, you will achieve it, you will go for it, and you will do it regardless of how hard it is. And that's where that's where mental toughness comes in, and mental being able to deal with the, the kind of drama and of life and the things that can happen. Because when I look at, I don't know if, about your experience, and we'll go into that shortly, but for me, the biggest difference between then and now is, is kind of a known... Well, for example, with the things you're speaking about there, about discipline, motivation, have professional mindset of known, even just nutrition-wise and exercise and things like that, I didn't really know anything about any of that. So I was at my worst, at my worst and at my kind of suicidal point, 
I was very overweight. I was I was heavy in alcohol and everything else that you can think of. And uh, from a very young age, so there was no and there was no structure to my life whatsoever. Um, so there's no and, and I think when you're in that hole, when you're in that so-called kind of position where you don't know where to pick yourself up off the floor, kind of thing. Um, because it's not a tangible thing, because you can't reach out and touch it, you don't really know where to go. Or how, or, and when people tell you, you know, if you told me what the thing, things you're saying right now when I was in that place, I'd have been like, I have no idea what that guy's talking about. But, uh, but, I think, but I think at the same time, you're right. And I feel like that's why the support, the support, so you, relationships, building relationships with people is huge. So if I was to build a relationship with you and speak to you and then gain your trust and your belief that this guy wants the best for me, he's not just out there or he's not just after uh, something for himself, but he wants to share this, that and the other. And then, then I feel like you would then start to think, yeah, yeah, and exactly. I start to, yeah, exactly. and I think that is the starting point for me is is the building building of a relationship um, and the support network, um, and that's why I think with with pro mindset it's about doing things a little bit differently. It's about creating that um, almost community of of people that want to be part of it yeah. and. You yes, I have a professional mindset, and I'm really successful because of it. And I've gone and got help from him, him, her. Um, I've watched him do that, but it's allowed me to have this thing where, for example, in pre-season, we did a run yesterday, and there's five of us. I'm the oldest by 12 years, um, and I was able to draw upon so many different things that I've developed over time. And you could argue that it's through experience, but I believe it's because I'm conscious and I understand it. So I know how to, when it's getting tough and I'm last, I know that I'm not going to finish last because there's three minutes to go and the two lads that are in front of me are going to struggle. Um, yeah. So it's about like being focused, uh, sticking, not being affected by them people, sticking to what I'm doing. Um, and it's, there's so many different things that you can develop and, and put into your makeup but it's about like what you said awareness and understanding the more you are aware and the more you understand the better you can become and it's, it's such a great point you're making there's a couple of things I want to touch on there which is when you talk about being maybe being in that position and then realising you're not going to finish last because you know that you've got that extra bit in your mindset that yeah. comes at the place when you know but when you know that you're physically you're physically at the same level as to whoever you're against. Um, it, it becomes a battle of who's got the stronger mind, who's, who's going to run the extra yard when, it, when when the back's against the wall. And that only comes from, like you say, having that professional mindset and knowing that, yeah, this feels hard, this feels tough, but it's not anything to do with my physical capability. It's more to do with my mind telling me this is, this is too much when in actuality. Well, if you if you were to say to your mind as you're doing that, you're doing those scenarios and you're going through it, and you were to say to yourself, no, actually, I can do this, rather than saying, I'm burst, this is too hard, I can't do this anymore. Uh, um, which is which is why you see that, but that comes to why you see, why do you have January where everybody joins the gym, everyone joins the gym in January, everybody talks about when it's a new year, new year, you know, like they go to the gym, for the month or the two months and you don't see them for the rest of the year um, and people yeah. make jokes about that people make you know that's like an ongoing joke that people make about it but what i would say is that that's more of a that's more of a sort of what's the word to use impact on what our society is and how people are joining these gyms because they're wanting to improve their body image and they're wanting to be they're wanting to fit into the mold of social media and how everyone every every guy has the same haircut <laughs> every guy wants abs and every girl wants uh, the same sort of body because of all these different things but but you only you have to realize that we all come, we all come, we all come in different shapes and sizes and, and different backgrounds and different experiences and you're not going to when you when it to to go back to what i'm saying about the gyms and things a lot of those people are doing it for the physical benefit. But the problem with doing it for the physical benefit 
is that that doesn't come until five, six months down the line. Um, and you don't get that unless you get serious, gen- like, not, you don't have to go mad, just consistency, just daily consistency of doing the thing. And what tends to happen is the reason why people fall off is because they don't have that mindset. They don't have that. You have to have the professional mindset to fall back on and know, I'm doing this for a bigger reason than what the six pack or going, you know, going on holiday. Um, and that's where what you're doing is so important to society. And that's what I think that's where we're lacking and realizing why do we go to the gym? Why are we active? Why do we want to do these things? Why do you want to sprint past the guy when you're behind, lacking behind them? What are you doing it for? What is the reason yeah. for it? Um, which I think is what people struggle with the most. And, you ha- you starting that conversation is only going to benefit people out there. So, yeah, I think I think people want instant gratification, and it's a, it's a society thing. People want instant results in everything that 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 we do, and it's about like I said, their professional mindset is about discipline. It's about um, understanding that small steps, like what we said right at the beginning, it's about taking small steps and being consistent, being professional, being focused. Um, all these things that that when you become or you have this profession, this is why I think it can get misconstrued. It's it's almost like this gives you this is the foundation, and then it allows you to do so much with what you've got. Yeah. Um, whereas if you just go off and do your own thing, like for me when I was at Newcastle, I had ability, so I had technical ability, and it got me to a Premier League debut. But I didn't have the the foundation, so it didn't last very long. Um, yeah. whereas I believe if I'd have had the foundation I'd have, I'd have probably you'll never know but I would have had a, a better career at a higher level for longer um, mm. so for me having a professional mindset and, and being aware of all these things gives you the foundation and, and you've done it as well you're, you're living proof of that well, thank you um, what, what you're saying that is proof is proved by the strong fitness you're having to your career of what you're saying over the last few years, how many players have you met that have the have had they kind of finish? Most of them, like you say, kind of peter out and don't. Uh, they have that sort of end to the career where they go. Everyone goes, oh, he's he he uh, continued longer than they probably should have, kind of thing. And you've managed to sort of change that narrative and say, no, that's not the case. And changing your mindset, I firmly believe that you're right in saying that because you proved that with what you've achieved over the last four or five years and your late 30s, which is not something you see on a regular basis, through having the pro mindset that you speak about. And that work, I would argue that work that you're going to do now after your career is going to be, after your football career is going to be more important than actually what you've done during football. Yeah. Um, because as much as I love poetry, football and sport, the I really do think that going through the things that I have, when, when we talk about this professional mindset idea, um, having that sort of, if you ask anybody, they'll tell you how much up and down I've been through the years. Well, I'll have a couple of months where I'll be really on the ball, getting getting really good shape, and then I'll have a couple of months where you don't see me. And that's been a kind of consistent thing almost through all my life before the last maybe year or two, uh, through starting to develop and develop that pro mindset out of my own realization that I didn't like how I was feeling and try to figure out what the things were that benefited me and made me able to be the best version of myself. So I look at that and I go, but why was it it took me that long to realize that? And I think the biggest reason is that you're not encouraged to be yourself. You're not encouraged to look at what you enjoy and not know what your friends want you to do or what your social group wants you to do or what life is sort of telling you what to do and not actually what you're thinking inside your own mind. Um, for example, you know, I like to go to the gym. I like to get up early and I'm kind of bad with it. Like I, I go, most days I go twice a, a day for, a few, for for two, three hours at a time. And then um, people will tell you, people will tell me, you're, you're just, it's totally mad what you're doing. Um, <laughs> but I, I come out of it with a with a different level of clarity and different level of uh, ability to project myself in the way that I want to be seen. 
and I think that a lot of people struggle to be themselves because they don't want to accept the things that actually they know make them feel good, but maybe aren't so much socially accepted. Do you know what I mean? Um, no, I, I totally agree, and I think it'll be different for different people because depending on who you surround yourself with, who's your, who your friends, who your support network is, your family, and, and sometimes it isn't always your family who are who are supportive because I, I always talk about mind maps. Um, so people's mind maps are different. Not one person has the same mind map as somebody else. We might have things in common with people, but um, we were all brought up thinking different things. Um, so what's important to me isn't necessarily important to you. But we were conditioned with our upbringing and, and how we were sort of um, brought up with our parents, with our family, with our friends, with things that maybe happened to us along the way. Um, and to that point, that's how you think and that's what you think is is happening. Um, yeah. But like, like what you said, you can change that. I was yeah. never led to believe that I could change that and that was just the way I am here all the time. Like, it's just the way I am. Um, but it isn't because... You've almost conditioned yourself to be that person, but if you want to be somebody different, then it's just about thinking differently and starting this the sort of the routine of putting things into place. Definitely, um, definitely. So I think you're dead right. I mean, we talk about social groups there uh, and how the environment the environment you're in can have such a very effect, and I think that's so true because I think naturally one of the reasons why I go to the gym for so uh, in such a kind of intense way at times when I do it is because I mean, quite an addictive personality, and um, and from a young age in Scotland, you know, like said, like said, drinking and taking drugs is quite a socially accepted thing. People yeah. talk about people talk about it like it's it's weird if you're at the age of 18, 17, 18 and you're not taking drugs and, and drinking all the time. And um, so, through being somebody that was going through a lot of things with his disability and not sure where he really fit in the world or what he seen himself. I just wanted to do whatever I needed to do to for people to accept me and to be to be seen as normal kind of thing, be part of any, any sort of friend group anywhere. And that was like, that was kind of where I was at at that time. And one, so because of the way this kind of Scottish culture is at that age, you're, you're sort of in this bracket where I go, well, I didn't know anything, I didn't know anything about making drinking or taking drugs and I thought that that was just the norm and everybody did it. I didn't, I didn't actually know it was a bad thing because nobody tells you, nobody actually educates you on it and so yeah. you, you kind of end up in these environments where you're doing things that aren't good for you and drinking was something that a lot of people, a lot of people can do it, a lot of people can go for a casual drink and I couldn't and um, while well, my friends were able to drink and live normal lives I was becoming virgin on alcoholic but <laughs> for me, just 17 years old, you know what I mean? And there was yeah. no way. I think when you talk about not being able to realise it until uh, certain kind of things like that, somebody told you something. For me, it was more like it got so, I got so low so fast that I had no choice. <laughs> like, yeah. I, had to, I had to do something because. And, I, and I, I credit my family for that. I credit for, and you talk about environments and we're almost lucky to be born where we are. You can be born anywhere in the world where the majority of the world is in poverty and the majority of the world is not doing too well. And we are luckily enough to be born with great families and great upbringings that way. And, and I know it had a great effect on me. What kind of effect did your upbringing have on you and who had an influence on you growing up? Um, so I had uh, arguably one of the best, <laughs> one of the best, everybody will, will say that, that they had such a good upbringing, well, not everybody, but I, I couldn't have had a better upbringing, if you like. Um, so I have mum, dad, sister, small town, uh, family around me. We didn't, we sort of struggled to, we weren't the richest family, but we didn't struggle for things. Um, but at the same time, this is where, like my mentality was a small town mentality. So I'm from a small town um, and it was almost like I was led to believe that certain things weren't achievable um, and people on the telly and they were almost like aliens. Um, and 
yeah, it, it, it was it was like that. And for me, my mum and dad divorced at 16. Um, and that was really difficult for me to take because, like you just said there, I never saw it coming. We were a really happy family. And then one day my mum left. Um, and, yeah, my, my dad sort of drank. Uh, and it was tough. It was It was really difficult to to sort of, to understand that I, I, I coincided with me moving to Newcastle and then I lost my granddad to, to cancer at 20, 21. So I, I literally watched him. I was in his, in his, in his room when he died um, and seen him dead. So somebody you asked who, who inspired me, my granddad inspired me more than anybody. Um, him and my dad were my, my two inspirations. Um, and I, I lost, basically at 16, my my family home, my family togetherness, and I lost my biggest inspiration at 20, 21 um, through cancer, w watched him sort of deteriorate for nine months and then watched him die. And it was difficult and, and I never sort of dealt with that up until sort of 21 years old um, when I started sort of developing my own mentality. And that's, it's, I think, Grief is one of those things that people don't really talk about very much and overcoming that kind of aspect because, again, it's, it's, it's amazing to hear you say that because I think our experience with that is very similar in the sense of my inspiration was my, well, everyone, most people would say grand, but I, she was my nana, that's what we called her. And um, she was that to me. And during when all this was going on with the alcohol and stuff, I just, I just kind of... I just kind of started to go to the gym and all that, but I was doing it for the wrong reasons. I was doing it because I wanted to get better, better physically and impress people and maybe get a wee friend or something down the line, like something like that. I was doing it for all the wrong reasons and it wasn't for any sort of personal development or any sort of pro mindset. And then during that time when I was starting to kind of slightly pick myself up, um, she, she passed away pretty suddenly. Uh, and, uh, and it was one of those things that I was, was kind of, uh, it put me back down to the bottom, you know what I mean? It was like, because I just started, I just kind of started to try, you know what I mean? And then, the, then that kind of came out of nowhere and it was like, I don't really know what to do with this. Um, and it makes me, I guess the question after that is, how did you go about actually being able to cope with that and process it and then be able to, continue to be as positive as you are? Yeah, so I didn't. Um, I struggled big style sort of when, when my granddad passed away. Um, and like you said, I didn't know how to deal with it. I didn't know what to do. I started drinking. Uh, and then I moved moved to Exeter. Um, and yeah, I struggled in a big way. And, and like you say, until sort of I started to develop my mindset and my understanding of, of all these things. I've since then lost my other granddad, my nana, my grandma and my mother-in-law. Um, and all four of them people, well, three of them people, I was there with them when they died, when they passed away, um, like sat with them. And the difference from, from when it happened at 20 with my granddad to, to the other, other people that I talked about, like I draw upon inspiration from from their lives um, because I'm still alive uh, and watching somebody have take their last breath, um, watching somebody deteriorate that quickly. Um, my mother-in-law had a brain tumor, and to see that happen to somebody who was so close to me was was really really difficult. But at the same time, I draw huge inspiration at that. I, I find it really difficult to whinge or moan about about things. I'm always looking at, and at the positive of life and how things can improve and get better and how can I help other people and pass on my knowledge and experience. And that's that's something that evolved from obviously not being able to deal with it the first time. Um, but I think over the years, this is this has also allowed me to deal with sort of mental health issues and things that otherwise would have would have really affected me yeah and i think you make a really good point there when you talk about how 
when we speak about these things and grief and that is, 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 is how do you, you is, there's a hopelessness to it at first where you're not really sure where to go but, but, but taking inspiration from it in the sense of being grateful for life and realising that you know this thing doesn't last forever but when you take it and you put you apply yourself it can really be a wonderful thing you can make people different and I think for, for us the biggest thing that I can say for, the, for maybe the two of us, but especially yourself, is something that's achieved everything that you have, is that you become very empathetic to people, or just in the sense of you, you, you've been through, you know what it's like to be the lowest of the low, you know that feeling, and everyone experiences that feeling differently, even though we had similar experiences, we would have felt it differently, um, because that's just what life is like and everyone experiences things differently but having experienced that feeling of being low regardless of the circumstance we then you then develop and say i'm going to kind of live this life i would rather not have as many uh, other people experience that kind of feeling i had but you had because you go through it and you go if i can help people deal with that deal with those issues quicker than i was able to then they can fulfill their potential quicker than i could have and yeah. that, that's what makes the world better. You know, that's what makes this whole thing more interesting. And um, I think that it's something, that, that's why I like to talk about these things, because these kind of things, for all the podcasts that you see, for all, for all the different media outlets, these kind of areas of life are just sort of hidden in the corner. You, you don't really hear much about it. You don't hear guys talk about it. And it, people will look at you and me and go, they seem like they're, they're doing okay, you know. They have as if it's as if it just happened, and you're in, you you've not had you've not had to deal with any of these things. So it's good, it's important that when people see the success you've had and the success I hopefully go to have at the same sort of level, you look at it and they go, um, it's important for them to know what what we experienced and how when I talked about earlier about about the professional mindset. And how if you'd said all this to me when I was at that point of my life, I wouldn't have understood it. I wouldn't have registered with me. Um, the way in which it is able to register and the way in which the reason why you're able to get through people is because you're able to relate to what they're feeling. So in order, so being able to relate to their, their feeling, you're able to then communicate to them ways to deal with that in a way in which they want to listen to you which I think is the biggest yeah. problem um, for, all the, for, all the, for all the mindset people that are, for all the inspirational, motivational things that you see, people don't talk about the thing that has to happen before that, which is the person yeah. actually listening to what you're saying. Yeah. Um, you know? So in terms of, no. in terms of yeah, communi you... communication, communication is what I'm trying to say. Communication in this whole thing is a very key thing. You know, and how you how you sort of, what's the word, put yourself across. Um, and I feel that's, communication is one of the things that people don't, they like to get to, you like to get to the jazzy part of it. <laughs> people like to get to the point of it yeah. where it's like, <laughs> it's like, I overcame all this and this is how I did it and I'm, I'm amazing and the motivational part of it and you go, and you do get motivated from it, you go, that was really amazing with that guy I did, but how did he do it? You know, uh, and, they don't really talk about the element of how how do you go from not not knowing any of this stuff and not really understanding any of it to actually listening to someone that you talk about and opening your mind to that. Well, the, the only reason, the only way you would do that is if somebody is able to relate and communicate that sort of um, experience to you and how you work on that. So, I guess my question from this is, how did you? How were you able to manage to develop yourself where you felt as though you could impact people with your own experiences to communicating in the way you did? Was there a process in becoming somebody that was able to communicate in a way that people would relate, relate to and understand on that level? No, it's a, it's a great question. And I think um, for me personally, it's about being real and I always go back to why I'm doing it. So 
whenever I have a little wobble or whether I have a little sort of think about why would people listen to me or why am I doing this? Or I always go back to, I'm, I'm, I'm doing it because I want to help as many people as possible, prevent people from feeling how I felt. Um, and I, and I know for a fact that this, this sort of way of thinking can take people's games to the next level. It can make them feel better about themselves. It can improve their mental health. Um, and it's, it's, creating a support network in my opinion like i said at the beginning so it's creating a community of people that want the same things out of life because this isn't for everybody um not everybody will buy into this and you're not going to change everybody which is something that when i first started doing things like this i was like why wasn't anybody why wouldn't everybody want to feel the best they can feel and achieve but not everybody wants to do that not everybody's willing to open their minds up to things like this but you can and will i always say if i can help or affect one person in a positive way then it's been worthwhile um and i always go back to that whenever that happens um i've always felt from a young age that i've been able to communicate with people um in a way in which sort of almost get my my story across or my I feel like if you if you if you're believable, so if you're saying it and you believe in it and it's true, you're not trying to put it on, you're not trying to make it up, you're not trying to say it for ulterior motives, then people will will I feel like people will understand that. Um and that's the way I've always tried to do it and come across. Um and I enjoy it. That I I really, really enjoy helping other people. It's a real passion of mine and always has been, um, from when I was a young age. Um, whether I was in the playground and someone had fallen over or um, I would see somebody crying or getting uh, some stick or bullied or whatever, I would always have empathy and sympathy and would always want to go over and try and make them feel better and help them. And I think as, as time's gone by and as things have evolved, um, I've always been analytical and always analysed things as my own career has gone on um, and helped other people as well. I mean, you can definitely see that from even the first conversation we had before this podcast just now. We had never spoke before, and I can I really I could tell from the first ten fifteen minutes of talking to you that you know the fact that you were wanting to do this podcast and the way you spoke to me and the way that you treated me as your equal right off the bat with it. There was there wasn't any sort of um, because it, well as somebody in a good show you you meet a lot of people that are quite condescending quite. They tend to look at you, talk to you as if they're looking down at you, and not talk to you as if you're a human. So I can yeah. feel that I can feel that from you from the first five ten minutes of speaking to you and having this kind No, of and it was and it was likewise. It was likewise. You know, I came off that phone call with you, and I was I was blown away with what we had in common. Um, and it's not very often you speak to somebody and you think, oh my god, that was amazing because how he's thinking exactly how what I'm thinking and. I had a really, really good conversation. So as much as you felt sort of enthused by it, I did as well. And um, I said to my wife, that was unbelievable. Um, and it's inspiring for me. And I've mentioned it to you since that what you're doing is very similar to what I'm doing. Um, and it takes a lot, you know, to to be that type of person and to offer yourself almost every day to other people. It, it, it comes with a lot of responsibility um, and at the same time I, I enjoy that responsibility yeah it's, it's so true it's, it's it's one of those things that throughout my life whenever I would join in like a group activity and sort of blend in with everyone else um, I'm sure I've got a few that seems to agree with this where I was none of it felt as if it was me as if I was really truly doing what, even from like the early age of 15, 16, I didn't really, I didn't want to be put people down. I didn't want to um, affect anyone in a negative way. And that was just the core of me from the early on. But I, through my life, I was kind of convinced through things that happened to me and meeting the wrong people at the wrong time that thinking that way was the wrong way to think. And it wasn't the way that you were going to. You know, the whole saying, nice guys, nice last, is something that I 
that I will argue to the death. <laughs> because <laughs> yeah, this guy finished far from last because we we get a buzz off of helping people and there's nothing there's no better feeling even today since, since this podcast started I've spent most of my time talking to other people and help, try to help them through things they've been through not through being some sort of qualified professional in any way but through them listening to the podcast and relating to what I'm saying and reaching out and saying that they don't have that support system that we spoke about and they, they want help and things like that and I took great joy of helping that because as you say when I started doing this I did it for the hope that one person would see it and it would make some sort of difference. So to have that sort of impact and get that feeling, even today, going at this podcast just now, I like to get in my zone and kind of thing and make sure that I've had a good day and I've ate and I've been productive and ready to have a good conversation um, to get the most out of it as possible. But today it didn't quite go with plan because I had a bunch of people reach out to me from... Um, it seemed the podcast seemed to get me a bit of a boost today. Just I don't know why or what happened, but a bunch of people reached out, and I spent most of my day um, talking things through with people I'd never, I'd never met to, met or spoke to <laughs> in my whole life. So it ended up being a case of I got to about six o'clock, knowing that we were doing this at half six, or half six, yeah. And, and thinking I've not been to the gym today, and I've not, I've not had my usual routine. And normally, when I've not been to the gym. It's kind of one of those things where I go, am I going to be able to talk the way that I want to talk? You know, am I going to have the same sort of confidence? Because that's what it does for me. So, that, so, but, but it was okay. Normally in my life, that would have been a stumbling block that would have made me text you and go, could we maybe put this off tomorrow, till tomorrow or something? And it, But it wasn't the case anymore because I came into it really happy for my day because it helped out two or three people, hopefully in some sort of way. And that to me was just as productive as eating a healthy meal, meal or going to the gym for a couple of hours. And so when you, when you find that sort of purpose, life becomes a whole lot easier. And you end up, when you're able to kind of reach out and help other people in that way, you get some sort of satisfaction for it. It's, it's hard to describe for people that don't understand that. And yeah. you talk about not being able to change everyone's mind. Um, which is at the start of it, it's kind of frustrating because, like you say, you're kind of like, why, why do you know why I do this? Um, but then I take it back and I go, there was a point in my life where this was unthinkable. It was totally unthinkable. Even doing something like this for you right now was just not something that I was thought I'd be able to do. And it only, I was only able really to do it when I decided that it wasn't about, it wasn't about me. If I mess up, if I speak to you and mumble some words or kind of lose track of my thoughts and I go, I go, oh God, there would have a time in my life where I would, I would have went, I've messed this up now, this, this whole podcast has done, <laughs> everything's ruined, you know what I mean? Um, yeah. And, but now I'm, able, now I'm able to move on and keep going because, and think about what I'm saying, because it's not about me. It's not about, if people listen, if people listen to this and go, that guy is really annoying to listen to him. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> some somebody else listens to it and goes, actually, I took something from that. It's not about the guy that finds it annoying, it's about the pe- person that finds it beneficial. And that's yeah. what you need to focus on because in life, there's always a negative to the positive and you get to choose what what one you, what, what you pick. And it's about making, that, making people aware of the fact that you can choose everything you do as a choice. When people say, I had no choice, there's always, always, always a choice. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> and um, I think having this kind of conversation with you is something that I hope can open up eyes to it and really really emphasise the point that, you know I keep saying it but it's true anything is possible you can do literally anything you want to do in your life and uh, because some of me joked about, about um, we were out the other day and I was talking about the podcast and stuff and he was like uh but you couldn't do everything though. And I go, what do you mean? Well, he goes, you couldn't be like first minister or something. And I go, well, yes, I could. <laughs> if I wanted to be, I don't want to be, though. You know what I mean? So, but like, the point is, is that um, you can achieve anything. And there's, there's this idea that, there's this idea, these, these dreams that people have that seem so far out of reach and seem so... Uh, Unrealistic, and people say you need to 
be more grounded and be more um, realistic in your approach. Realistic doesn't exist. It's not. It's not. It's this thing that humans have created. Is is sort of to keep everyone in line and keep everyone in their own box. But you don't have to be in your own box. You can be whatever it is you want to be. And the quicker you realize that, the more satisfying life can be. Um, yeah. So to go back to what you were talking about with the what you're doing now after football, one of the things that I wanted to ask you about was how you, I, I believe you recently, well, not recently, years ago, did a charity run uh, raising 50000 for child prevention of, I, I'm forgetting the total title right now, but do you, do you recall what it is I'm talking about? The NSPC, we went to Machu Picchu in Peru and did the Inca trek, raising money for the NSPCC, but we spent a year um, doing different initiatives, uh, Naked Calendar and um, Come Down With Me, and there was loads of different things, but we yeah, we raised about 50,000 over the year. Amazing experience, again, a life-changing experience for me going over to Machu Picchu, and we went on the Inca trek. It was six, seven-day trekking um, throughout the Andes, um, at high altitude, 15,000 feet. It was, again, it was a life-changing um, experience for me. And I always say things like that, going out of your comfort zone. This was in the off-season when everyone's going on holiday. Um, we decided to go there and, and experience that. And um, it was a really good sort of rewarding experience, seeing how people live over there, uh, people that live that far up in the Andes. And again, it's it's, it's things you can draw upon when things get tough and but get difficult. And it was something that definitely um, advised people to do if, if they get the opportunity. I mean, it's, it's, I was reading, when I was reading about it, I really thought it was very inspirational what you did there. And it made me wonder your passion for helping the children and helping raise money for that kind of thing. Where did, where did that thought of really, we spoke about you being the owner of the, the, program for the children but in terms of your overall really wanting to do something like that where you're putting yourself through sort of a physical ordeal to raise this money like where's that motivation stem from again it's it's like everything that i do um not everything that i do but a lot of the things that i do to help other people I, I've been in that I've been in that situation I've been that age I've been at stages where I want I want to be inspired. I think it's whether that be people that are struggling um, or people that just need that different perspective on what they can achieve. I think being able to, I think it's so important, obviously three kids of my own to do the same, inspiring children to to be successful and be something. I think when you're from a small town, like I've alluded to, it's so easy to just, like you say, stay in your box and, don't revert from the norm. Um, whereas I feel like I'm the opposite. It's like, you can go and do what you want to do. Don't let anybody tell you that you can't do that or that or that. What do you want to do? Have aspirations. Go achieve massive things. Um, don't settle for average. That's what I always say. Don't waste time being average. Um, because... So true. Yeah, the world doesn't yeah, average. Every day. Well. Yeah. You, you, why waste time being average? Like, like go and be some somebody different and if that means uh, if you're 18 19 27 37 and you have to get rid of people that have you've been part of your life forever but you found out that they actually don't want you to be that person they want you to be the person that they are um they won't let you or in crowd and meet other people or find people who want the same thing again it's not for everybody but but that's why i i go down that route of, of trying to help and inspire the people because I really enjoy it. It's a really motivating thing to hear you say that and how you can how you kind of articulate that whole thing there where you're talking about your reasons behind that and how it's all about building children to believe that anything is possible. They can do these wacky things that adults that maybe have struggled through their life and, and not experienced what we've experienced and been able to sort of overcome that and, and put it into perspective tell children that they should focus on, you know, go for the secure job, go for the go for the thing that's going to get you security and all that, and don't go for the... And there was a great, there was a great video I seen many years ago, 
I'm sure they remember who it was now, but there was a quote they said that you can go for you can go for the job that's the, the secure one and go against the thing that you actually want, and then years from then lose that job and be left with nothing. So if you can fail at the thing that you yeah. don't, you can fail just as much at the thing that you don't want, you know, as the thing that you do want. So if you can fail at them both equally, why not go for the one that you do want? And that's what I would say in the last yeah. to this is that everything in every scenario in life you can there's always the chance that it doesn't doesn't quite pan out. But the way you look at it is what's important. Because if a failure to you means the end of something, uh, then that's where your mind's at. But the failure could mean to you that you now know how to learn from that and make sure the next time around you succeed. And yeah. That is, you know, that is one of the things. Even recently, like a story comes to, to my mind of over the past, like over even just the past year, where we we played in the we had we the Scottish Cup final. We ended up winning the game two 0 which was fortunate because I had a very glaring miss when it was 0 0 It wasn't the last Scottish Cup, but it was the Scottish Cup. Before. Yeah, it was the last Scottish Cup because this one last, this year got postponed. But it's it's no no, and I get a chance. It's kind of described as my bread and butter, where I usually just open goal, bottom corner, easy days. Everyone expects me to score it, and I totally miss hit it completely. It spun and missed the ball, and there was a big <laughs> gasp. There was a gasp in the hall of shock. Um, <laughs> do you know what I mean? And uh, after that happened, the next day I spent three or four hours in the hall myself. With this exact same ball and the exact same shot, and and made sure that I was there until I did not miss that ever <laughs> again. You know? So it was one of those things where I expected to score it and I missed it. And then then a few months later, after continuously training that same scenario with the same shot at the same time, a few months later on in February this year, I'm now I've been given. There's two Scotland teams that go to Leeds, and they give me the armband, and I, I, that that to me has been like a dream for many years of captain my country that I never thought I would get, and I got it, and I couldn't believe it, and I'm in this team, and I'm going. That's amazing. Yeah, it was just such an unbelievable feeling, and then what ends up happening is we were never really going to be able to. Well, I do believe we would have been able to win the tournament, but. Unfortunately, in the last game against a high quality team of Leeds, all our chairs gave bats gave out because we only had four players each. Um, so we were unable to kind of match them that way. But in the lead up to that, something happened where the two Scotland teams played each other. And um, we, were, we were losing 2 1. And there were a few minutes to go. And, it, and then there was a few minutes to go. There, there was like, I actually think it was a minute to go. And but it, was, it was as if all the work I'd done and all the preparation of my mindset, I was able to tell, you go there, you go there, you go there. And we all, they all just listened to me do it. And then it created this small gap in the team that we had this chance to score. And the ball came across to me the same way, the exact same way that it did in the Scottish Cup title. And I put it, and it was a much harder chance that I put in the bottom corner. And the... Uh, the reason why I tell that isn't some sort of brag, but it's more sort of say that that didn't just happen. I would have missed it again if I hadn't been, if I hadn't took the time to go. That's what's going to make, I need to make sure that if I get that chance, and it just so happened, little did I know though, I didn't know that doing that was going to lead to me being in that moment where I've got the pinnacle of my sport, which is Scotland captaincy, I believe. Well, that's what I believe is the pinnacle of my sport in my, in, for my country. And so I'm, I'm there. And uh, if I hadn't done that and I hadn't prepared myself, there's no way I would have been able to cope with the pressure at that moment. But because I trained so much, the pressure wasn't there because I wasn't thinking about the fact that I was Scotland captain, the play for Scotland, I was thinking about the fact that I know where to score this goal. Um, and I think the, the anxiety yeah. of performance comes from not believing that you're going to take that chance because you've not put the you've you've not put the work in to the point you put work in but you've not put the work in to the point where you know 
without any question of any doubt that you're definitely going to score it. Um, you know, so that's that kind of mentality is where you go when you when you talk about sport and you talk about people wanting to get to the next level. You have to take the training seriously. You have to, It's not about how many hours people will think people are telling you about or the way that you think they think you should train. It's about you, what you know about yourself and the things that you know that you're, you're able to do and the way that your own name works. So I'm quite an obsessive uh, to person, the way I spoke of it before. And I knew the only way I was going to be confident with it is if I was absolutely relentless with it and knew and just did it to the point of insanity where I just knew that it was going to be, that there was going to be no doubt in my head whatsoever. And that for me is what works for me, but there's a lot of people out there that don't want to analyse themselves to that point because doing what I've just described there takes a lot of work. And it's, uh, you want to believe that maybe, for as good as coaches are, they'll never know you the way you know yourself. So you also need to combine good coaching with your own opinion of what you know yeah. to be capable of and what you what your what your uh, strengths and weaknesses are. Because if you know what your strengths are but you don't know what your weaknesses are, you're never going to get better. Um, yeah. So you need to have a stable mind in order to have that honest conversation in your head. And I'm sure that's something that you've had throughout your career as well, being a been playing tennis football for so long. Yeah, it's it's very much like what you just explained there with the mindset as well. It's very much like you've got to keep practicing and practicing and working and working and working. So when things happen, you know that it's there. Like having that opportunity to score that goal, you know that when that opportunity comes, you're going to score. But it's like having to deal with disappointment. If you've been working at it, when it does come, you know that you're going to deal with it. Um, yeah. So it, it, they work hand in hand. Definitely, and I think it makes me also want to just touch on the fact that there's different elements to it where it's not just about the training of practicing and taking that shot. It's also what you're doing off the pitch in terms of what you're eating, how you train. If you're, if you're, if you're practicing taking that shot that we have described there, but you're not in physically good shape, um, then your, your mindset is not going to be strong enough to deal with it. Because your because the, your physical fitness goes in hand in hand with your mental health, I believe. If you, yeah. you it's very unlikely you're going to meet somebody that's struggling with their weight and struggling with being active that's got a good strong mentality. And that's not a criticism or anything. That's just the way that it is. For whatever reason, our body is linked to the way that our mind processes things. And it, the stronger you, the stronger you're able to take yourself out of that comfort zone the more you're able to perform at that level and, and push yourself to deal with the pressure. Um, the reason why I say that is because there's a lot, there's a lot of guys that play Polish football in, in, in my country that I know of and in England as well that work really hard and do put in the hours in the training, the training ground, but they don't necessarily look at the overall picture, um, which I think is one of the biggest problems with this sport because we're not encouraged we are not encouraged to be athletes. We've, it's promoted as a as an overall volunteer group activity and not a competitive athletic sport, which is what which is the difference that I'm hoping to make with this. And again, it goes back to having somebody like yourself who's been playing at such a high level for so long and been able to overcome the things that you have to be where you're at now, to then say, you're coming to me and we we'll have this conversation. And by us having this conversation, people will look at, I hope that people will look at disability sport and privacy football and how, you know, the guy I had on last time, Martin, table tennis, sports like that, differently, and how they, they look at how society looks at us as a whole. And I'm really appreciative of you taking the time to come on and talk to me about this. And, and you had no, there was no, there was no, um, sort of personal background where we had any sort of prior relationship where there was like Keenan my friend is going to, I'm going to come on for them it was just you recognising that I'm trying to do something and wanting to help that and I really do appreciate that 
I, I think that's the biggest thing. I, 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 it's been a pleasure. Um, I've really enjoyed coming on and sharing my experiences and listening to, to yourself. I think the one thing that we did have in common is, like you said, we, we both want to make a difference and try and help other people. And I think that's huge. I think that was the sole reason why I picked up the phone um, and we've, we had the, the initial discussion because um, it's not something that I do f not for everybody. It's not something that you, somebody asks you to do something and you're like, yeah, yeah, or no, no. It's, it's what, why, why, did, why, what, what is it about? And it's, it, for me, this is what it's about. It's about two people who, are, who have something very much in common both play football and both want to be successful, um, but also want to share their experiences, journeys with, with other people so that they can help um, them be successful and have aspirations like we've, we've spoke about. So I've really enjoyed it. It's been, it's been a pleasure. Um, and I appreciate you asking me on. And like I said before, when, when I start my podcast up, um, I'd love you to come on ours as well. I'd absolutely love to do that. I've, I've, I've taken great pleasure from this conversation. And I've learned a lot from you as you're talking. And to be honest, it's motivating to hear that you're not there. Like, because part of you goes, when you when you have this sort of mentality of wanting to help people, you at first, if you're not in the right kind of group of people, you sort of there's there's almost trying to convince you that you're the only one, as if you're as if you're some sort of crazy person, and. <laughs> um, so it's always satisfying to really start this podcast and be talking to the guys that you make me go, do you know what I'm, I'm enjoying doing what I'm doing? And it's making me meet people like you that make me go, I finally feel like I am who I'm supposed to be. And it helps me to listen to people like you and tell your story and be able to take in what you're saying and really realising that I enjoy hearing people that are really trying to make a difference and really trying to move the needle in, in our world and make, make a better place. So I really do appreciate it, and it's it's been a great experience for me, and I'm glad that you've enjoyed it. And I hope that maybe down the line, and once this goes, we can do it again. Definitely. Um, I wish you all the success as well. I hope, um, like you say, you achieve all your goals and um, things go really well next season. Um, and I keep my eye out for how you're getting on as well. Thank you. I mean, the the the, the, te the team in England that I'm with. Are newly promoted. Uh, we finished third in the championship last year, but I do feel that we were we would have been in this year when it had the had we had a couple of different things quite differently. But that's just football sometimes, and um, I think there's a big kind of question mark as to whether Scotland Scottish players like myself can really deal with the standard of England down there. And I'm, but what they don't realise is, is that I know with the mentality I have and the way I feel about it, that being one of the top players in England, whether it's next year or, or five years from now, is, um, is more of a when, not enough. It's, it's inevitable. Yeah. People may be in English League listening to this, but that guy is <laughs> of his absolute rocker. Um, <laughs> because we'll probably be fighting to stay in the league next year. That's probably, that's kind of the position that we're in right now. Obviously, we aim to be higher and hopefully we can Perform. I know that the T C guys own own Swift. That I know you're. Yeah, you're, I know. And yeah. Yeah. How, how do you know one? Actually, it's a it's a good question. Through my through my wife. Um, like I said, she works at the hospital, and um, she introduced me to Owen. Um, his collection of football shirts. Um, so I thought I'd had a a Doncaster shirt. Um, spoke to him, and um, yeah, it was amazed when when you both knew each other and you were playing for. For Seaside, so um, yeah, yeah, like you say, he was dead excited to have that. I was having you on, and uh, the guy puts in a lot of work. And T said is a wonderful, it's a wonderful environment to be in. And he took me in when he didn't really have to do that. I was we met in Portugal actually doing the course that led to this podcast, we did the f football for all right. course, and we were both doing different projects. And we met there, and I was talking about frustration and wanting to get to the next level and seeing how everybody was playing down in England. And, wanting to play that kind of style of football and he said that they had just made that club and he asked me to come along and um, he rightly was thinking to himself well this guy isn't going to want to come down to England every week to play football is he? No, there's no way he's going to do that but he doesn't didn't know at that point how crazy I am 
<laughs> so now he does. Exactly. So as soon as he gave me the opportunity, I was like, I'll be I'll be there every week. And I, I'm sure when I first said that, it was like, no chance he's going to be there every week. But I have been, and I know that it's, it's a matter of time to where I'll be at a point where the English guys will go, you know, the Scottish guys are doing all right. And I'm, that's all I plan on doing is every game, taking something from it, working hard and keep going. And it's not about necessarily any goal, but just a constant evolving improvement and trying to help the Scotland game as well. Take that back to here and, and kind of up our national team and up our, up our uh, standard of football here so that we can then one day hopefully compete with English teams and the national teams in a better level than we are right now. So yeah, that, that's uh, I think we've pretty much went over every possible subject. We could. Yeah, yeah. I really, again, it's been a great joy for me and thank you so much for coming on. Brilliant. Cheers.